Teaching writing can feel like trying to choose which candy to eat in Willy Wonka's factory. There are so many intriguing options, but there also seem to be a lot of ways to end up in serious danger. It's magical and fun, but also scary. What do you think? Does the simile hold up or am I reaching? Well, today in episode 147, I'm excited to share some creative tips and ideas for your writing program from a half dozen wonderful teachers, thinkers, and writers. These guests have a whole lot of experience teaching writing, and each one brings a unique creative possibility here for you to consider. Whether you're looking for new ways to structure your writing program, writing options that don't bring about exponentially more grading, creative ideas for prompts, or fresh spins on argument units and narrative, you'll find something wonderful to try in today's episode. So are you ready? Let's do it. Hey there, I'm your host, Betsy Potash, and one-pagers, project-based learning, and choice reading are my jam. I believe in you, and my goal is to help you explore all the creative possibilities you dream of for your classroom. I'm an educator, a chocolate cake aficionado, a traveler who can't wait to get back to Barcelona, and the kind of mom who brings her own mini maker space to her kid's classroom when she comes to volunteer. I know this for sure, creativity isn't always easy. As a creative teacher, you get parent calls you treasure, and plenty of sidelong comments you'd rather forget. But here's the bottom line, creative education can ignite a spark in your students and change their lives forever. You and I know this, you're an innovator, and while it's sometimes hard, it's so worth it. So let's explore the world of creative education together. Welcome to the Spark Creativity Teacher Podcast. Hi, this is John Spencer from the Creative Classroom Podcast, and I want to share a specific idea um, which is not necessarily a big writing project. It's it's similar to what a lot of us already do, but it's a little bit of a tweak on a classic. So I love writing prompts. Um, in fact, I actually have a whole bunch of video writing prompts that you can find on my YouTube channel um, with kind of sketch note leading people through each part of the writing process. But I want to talk about um, using open-ended visuals for writing prompts in a couple of different ways. So the first way is to teach perspective. And so I love to do something like have an interesting visual or an an interesting video and giving students an option um, that gets them thinking from a different perspective. It could be um, within that picture, say there's a bus or a car, tell the story of what's going on from the perspective of one of the cars in that picture um, or a specific object. It could be something like you are an alien, you just landed on our planet, and this is the very first thing you see. Describe what you think is going on from the perspective of an alien who has never seen our world before. Or it could be similarly, you know, Someone from the 1700s gets in a Doctor Who style time machine and is, you know, suddenly landing here in this location. Describe what's happening from that person's perspective. So it becomes a way to teach perspective and it's a lot of fun. A second thing that I love to do is open ended writing prompts where um, you simply find a really interesting visual or a really interesting picture and you simply say, tell this story. Or you might have an interesting um, location and say, you get to redesign this space. What will you do with this space? It could be an old abandoned mall, for example. And the goal is to get them thinking creatively and and just writing more as a warm-up. So again, one of them is focused on perspective. The second one is open-ended, and it's focused more on, on creative thinking. And then the last one is to have students look at a visual or a picture of what's going on And this is for ELL students. They generate a list of all the nouns they can see, all the verbs they can see. Then they start coming up with some adjectives. And then you give them a verb tense formula, right? So it could be the past perfect progressive verb tense. And you give them um, the formula. They have the nouns, the verbs. And now that begins the, the beginning process of telling a story or writing something persuasive or whatever from the picture using the grammar that they need to learn, which 
for a lot of ELL students is a big um, challenge to learn some of that grammar. So those are three different ways that you can use visuals or videos as a starting place for writing prompts that are different than your standard, you know, regular writing prompts. Hi, I'm Samantha with Secondary Urban Legends, and I am glad that I'm able to share with you one of my favorite activities to do in the classroom when it comes to writing practice, and that's hosting a classroom trial. It started many years ago when I noticed that if you just simply say the word essays to students, they panic. So I switched gears and said, well, how can I teach them the skills that they need for writing, specifically argumentative writing, without them having to do an essay? So a lot of my ideas for writing in the first half of the school year focuses on skill-based instruction. I don't actually have my students write a full essay until the second half of the school year. This year in particular, we did a trial for our unit on the text, The Metamorphosis. Quick synopsis. The main character, Gregor, wakes up one day and he is a bug. And because of the different questions that revolve around how it happened, why it happened, sets up the opportunity for putting some of the other characters, his family members, on trial. Through running a classroom trial, we're able to practice building evidence, staying on topic when it comes to writing and building a case, how to close out an argument, how to open up an argument. So a lot of the skills that the students need for, quote unquote, an essay writing, they're able to practice it through building a case. So they were divided into the prosecution, they were divided into the defense team, they had to put together their witness list and witness statements and which evidence that they're going to pull from the text in order to support their um, different sides. The students loved it so much so they asked me, when are we going to do this again? So if you're looking for an interactive project-based learning way to get students into essay writing practice without doing an essay and not turning them off from the word essay, try hosting a trial in your classroom. For more ideas and some examples of this in my classroom, visit me at Secondary Urban Legends on Instagram or Facebook. Hi, my name is Amanda, and I am the author and teacher behind Mud and Ink Teaching, and I am also the co-host of the podcast, Brave New Teaching, and I have an awesome writing project to share with you today. One of my favorite things to do with students is teach them how to write a choose-your-own-adventure style narrative. I've used this narrative as a summative assessment for different novel studies, because what we ask students to do is change the ending of that novel. So if you've spent the unit working on narrative techniques and looking at how stories rise and fall and conflict and things like that, a great way to assess their skills is to see them actually develop alternate types of ways for the story to end. It's not too hard to do, but it's a little bit hard to get started. So I have a free teacher sample that I'm going to link in the show notes that you're welcome to take a look through. And you can see how I put together multiple different endings for Of Mice and Men. What you'll be able to see your students do is imagine the story as it is, but then based on what they know from what they've read and the way that they understand characters, the way that they understand how the characters have developed, they're able to make predictions and realistic guesses as to how the story could have gone differently with just a few details changed here and there. The assignment uses Google Slides, and basically all of the alternate endings are linked together slide by slide. So when the students present these alternate endings, it's actually a clickable digital 
product. So students will read a paragraph and then be able to choose that. Well, the, I'm sorry, the students who are participating will be able to read the author's paragraph, one ending, and then choose the next direction for the story to go. Upon clicking, they will end up on the next level of the story. And then they get to click again and again and again until they get to that new ending. So this freebie will show you how to get started, how to organize it for yourself and give it a shot. It's a lot of fun and a lot of great skills come from this type of assignment. Good luck and happy writing. Hello, everyone. I am Ashley Bible from Building Book Love, and I'm going to share my absolute favorite writing project hack. In this roundup, you're going to hear a lot of fun writing projects. My specific idea is more of a hack that can be applied to any writing project, specifically writing projects that you may have always wanted to try, maybe some that you hear on this roundup, but that you cannot fit in because you are too constrained on time, or you simply do not have the capacity to grade another set of writing projects. Okay, so here we go. We all know that the best way to develop better writing skills is to incorporate more practice. However, as I hinted to just a second ago, we all also know that more writing practice equals more grading. Womp womp. But what if I told you that you can fit in more writing practice and all the fun prompts you've been wanting to try with less grading than ever before? All right, drum roll. The secret is group essays. Hear me out. Sometimes when students hear the word group essays, well, okay, there'll be two reactions. One, they'll either be ecstatic <laughs> or they will be completely worried and freaked out that other students are going to bring down their writing grade. <laughs> but I'm going to give you all of my best tips to mediate both of these reactions and make this a great experience for you and for your students. The first step is to not tell them they are going to do a group essay. You will just do all of your pre-writing stuff that you normally do, but do not mention the word group essay. For example, you might uh, tape up four different prompts or scenarios or whatever, depending on your writing that you're doing in the four corners of your room. Then you could have have students walk to those corners and put their thoughts on sticky notes or their opinions if it's persuasive, just whatever the prompt is. Tell them, okay, now I want you to go to the corner that you feel most passionately about, the topic that you feel most passionately about that you want to write about. And so they would go there and that's going to be like your initial idea of getting students in in groups without them knowing they are in groups because you don't want them to pick a topic that they just want to write about with their friends. You want them to pick a topic that they really care to write about independently. So then with your teacher on the fly skills that I know you have, you are going to put them into smaller groups anywhere from two to four. Three is ideal, but it's not always going to work out. The main thing is that you have students in groups with the topic that they want to write about, that they think they're going to write about independently. Then you're going to pass out note cards or sticky notes or just even scraps of paper, or you can use Jamboard. There's lots of different ways you can do this, but you're going to have them write a thesis statement for that topic. This is going to be a silent practice, so they do not know they're doing a group essay yet. They're just going to write their best thesis statement on this note card, and you're going to tell them to leave their name off. Then you're going to do a whole class voting procedure. So the thesis statements will not have names on them, and students will go around, and with each group of three, they'll look at the three thesis statements, and they will put a tally mark on their favorite or the one that is the best one. So that is going to end up with a winner from that group. Now, first of all, notice all the students in the entire class have had practice writing that thesis statement. They all could technically set off and write their whole essay right now. But the point of this is to be 
collaborative writing process and to save time and to save your grading. So now you're going to tell them that winning thesis statement is the thesis statement that every person in the group, so you'll reveal now there's going to be a group, will follow to finish out this group essay. Then you can give them uh, more note cards if you're using the note card method, or they can get on a collaborative Google Doc, whatever. But each student is required to write one body paragraph that proves that thesis statement. So they will have their thesis statement, then they will each have one body paragraph. And they have to write the body paragraph independently, but they have to collaborate with their teammates to talk about what transitions they're going to use, what points they're going to write about because they can't repeat the points. And then at the end, they are going to collaborate on the introduction, flushing that out, and the conclusion. Once they have the entire group essay completed, they will then work to revise the essay or they could exchange with groups and do like a traditional peer review. But once it gets all together, you treat it as one essay, not three. And everybody will be getting the same grade on this writing project. So some of the students that might not be as happy about this group essay, they are going to really push back on everybody getting the same grade. But what group essays are amazing for is to give you time as a teacher to work individually with struggling riders. So if you know that a group has a struggling rider, you are going to really focus a lot of your attention on helping that rider, giving them the one-on-one -on -one feedback and help that they need. And in turn, of course, that is going to ensure that that person's writing is up to par with the rest of the essay. So it's really a win-win. And of course, it makes everyone want to really, really revise their papers, make it the best they can be because it is a group effort at this point. And nobody wants to be the one that brings the group down. I've done this group essay so many times over the years, at least once a semester with all kinds of different essay prompts. It is my favorite. I can usually get them graded in one single day. How amazing is that? And students will usually put forth the best writing they'll ever do because it's such a short goal for them. They can really put their all into it. And with the collaborative aspect, they are all working together to make it the best that it can be. I hope this inspired you to try it. I will put my blog post in the show notes with all kinds of other tips and group essay ideas for you to explore. Thank you. Hi there, it's Caitlin Mitchell from EB Academics, and I am so excited to share one of the easiest ways to help your students master all of the standards that we have to cover in ELA. And that is a very simple concept called spiral review. This is something that we hear about all the time in math classes, but for some reason, it doesn't seem to carry over into English. And what I found over the years and in working with thousands of teachers and as well as myself included in the classroom, I found that when I started to spiral ELA content for my students, it really gave them so many more opportunities over time to practice with these particular skills. So I want to give you two examples of how you can actually implement this into your own classroom. So again, the concept is spiral reviewing your content. So let's say I'm working with narrative writing and I want to figure out how can I spiral review my narrative writing throughout the school year. You know, oftentimes I've seen teachers just teach it in isolation for one or two months in their classroom and then that's it. You know, you never come back to narrative writing until students go to the next grade level and the next grade level and then perhaps they'll see it again. But in order to really help our students, you know, practice with this skill throughout the school year, we need to have it show up again and again in our writing, in our curriculum. So for example, if I'm looking at my narrative writing unit, one of the ways that I can spiral review narrative writing into my classroom is through the use of bell ringers. And I want to use intentional bell ringers. And these are the bell ringers that we have um, in our Teachers Pay Teachers Store and in our EB Teachers Club um, that I'm talking about. And we created the bell ringers from this need, right? I got myself, you know, finding when I was in the classroom that I would use a bell ringer for wacky word Wednesday or, you know, share your favorite thing Friday. And it, it became redundant. And I didn't feel like I was really making use of that time effectively in those first five or 10 minutes of class. And so I thought to myself, 
what if I used these first five or 10 minutes for bell ringers to spiral review our content, right? So with narrative writing, let's say I've taught my entire unit at the beginning of the year. You know, I've done my 15 day or three or four week unit, however long you spend with narrative writing at the beginning of the year. And then I'm going to use my bell ringers to come back to narrative writing throughout the school year. So I might have my bell ringers in November for one week be all about narrative writing, going back to leads, reviewing endings, having students write a short narrative in those five or 10 minutes of class, plot structure, et cetera. Well, my bell ringers in February and my bell ringers in May might do that same exact thing. So I'm giving them these other opportunities to practice with narrative writing. So that's one way to incorporate this concept of spiral review very easily into your classroom is to use bell ringers that are intentionally going back through the standards to help your students practice throughout the school year. Now, the second way that you can incorporate spiral review is simply by penciling it in to your scope and sequence. So if you batch plan, like we suggest heavily at EB Academics, if you're not batch planning, you definitely need to learn more about this concept. But if you do batch plan and you sit down and you're looking at your scope and sequence and you've laid out your whole you know, narrative writing unit at the beginning of the year, well, now you want to be intentional with how can I spiral review these concepts into my curriculum beyond just bell ringers, right? This is in addition to or um, in replace of. So I might look at my scope and sequence and be like, you know what? Every Friday, I'm going to incorporate 30 minutes for a narrative review spiral activity. And this might be in October. I'm going to pick, you know, the second Friday of October. And I'm going to set aside 20 to 30 minutes of my class time to do one specific narrative writing activity that's maybe focused on dialogue. And then I might do the same thing again in November with another narrative activity that's focused on leads and then endings and then plot structure. So in this way, I'm very intentional with my planning, ensuring that I'm coming back to these skills and these standards that I've already taught to my students, but that I don't want them to forget, right? And I like to think of it kind of like sports. Let's say I spend the whole beginning of the season of basketball just practicing my my three-point shot. That's it. And And then I don't come back to it again. So I spend the whole first season of basketball practicing my three-pointer, and then I don't practice my three-pointer again. Well, when I get to the championship game and I haven't practiced my three-point shot in two months, am I going to make the shot? Maybe, but I'm going to be a whole heck of a lot more likely to make it if I've been practicing it all along. So I like to think of these skills that we're teaching our students within our English classes as being akin to the skills that we're learning in any sport. And when we think about sports, we practice the skills all the time, right? At every practice. And while that's not necessarily feasible in an English classroom to practice all of the skills every single day, um, this is a way to ensure that we're giving students that opportunity to practice with these standards multiple times throughout the school year. So I hope that you take this concept and put it into practice. If you want to learn more about spiral review or learn more about what we teach at EB Academics, you can find us on Instagram at EB Academics. And we also have a podcast called the Teaching Middle School ELA podcast. All right. Hope you enjoy using this particular idea in your classroom. Hey there, it's me, Betsy, your host. I'm back. I wanted to join this fun conversation to share the idea of having your students write children's books in your class. Children's books are a lot of fun to examine as mentor texts, and they cover a huge range of themes and topics that can intrigue your students. They're written in so many different styles and are usually accompanied by powerful visuals, and you know how I love that. So there are a lot of angles you can take on a children's book project. Let's look at just a few examples to get your wheels spinning. You could use a children's book project when focusing in on SEL. You could take a look at children's books that feature characters that do not give up and invite your students to do research into positive psychology themes like mindset, grit, and choosing to develop character strengths over time. Then they could write stories that explore these topics, promote these themes in a way that works for kids. You could also use a children's book project when teaching about narrative writing. You could share children's books that develop intricate, unique characters, intriguing settings, surprising story arcs, and then invite your students to storyboard and create their own unique stories using some of these elements that you've been demonstrating. 
you could use a children's book project as the culmination of a unit on a whole class novel, inviting students to create a version of the book that you have read for young children, maintaining the elements that they think were most powerful and interesting, but simplifying the plot and structure dramatically. There are a lot of children's books like this out there. Maybe you've seen the new classic board book series that takes a lot of books from the literary canon and turns them into board books for toddlers. This could be cool inspiration for your students. Invite them to consider carefully how they can share what was truly the core of the novel that you've been reading, the core elements of character, setting, and themes, but in unique ways that would appeal to children. Every person's book will be so different. Last but not least, and this is a little out there, but I'm really intrigued by the possibility. If you've always wanted to try a multi-genre project, you could have students create digital multi-genre children's books with characters, for example, that children could click on to hear dialogue read out loud to them or setting elements that they could click to go to sound effects or videos that really took them on a deep dive into the setting. There are a lot of directions that students could go with a project like this. It's not really a genre that I've seen explored very much. And if you were intrigued by it, you and your students could really do some pioneering creative writing. All right, I'll be sharing more about children's books in ELA next month when I bring you an interview with Pernil Rip about this very topic. But hopefully you are excited to be thinking about all the many possibilities. Thank you so much for joining all of us today. I hope you're feeling so inspired by one of these concepts that you'll reach out to one of the guests and thank them for coming on the show with that wonderful idea. And then I hope you'll put it into play with your own unique twist and find great success with it in your classroom. Until next time, take care of yourself and stay creative.